In this video, we're going to talk about induced forces. Those are forces caused not by permanent dipoles, but by induced dipoles. So to review, if we look at intermolecular forces, we can rank them from strong to weak. So all else being equal, an H-bonding interaction is stronger than dipole-dipole interaction. So these are not induced interactions. These uh, I'm not going to review them because I'm assuming that for the purposes of this video that you've already seen them. So just to give a quick example, if we have something like a formaldehyde molecule, we can see that there's lone pairs on that oxygen that can act as an H-bond acceptor. And so if I have something like water, I can make an H bond. I'll show that in uh, green here between the hydrogen bond donor, the hydrogen on the ox on the water, um, and the lone pair on the oxygen. So anyway, so we can have an H bond interaction. And uh, if we have anything where both, if we have both molecules having a dipole moment, so in this case let's just do two formaldehydes. I forgot the carbon in there. So we could have two formaldehydes, and we can see that there's a, a big difference in electronegativity here. So we have a permanent dipole moment that looks like that. So if I have the other formaldehyde molecule lined up like this, then its permanent dipole is pointing in the same direction. And so we have the positive end of the molecule lined up with a negative end. They're close to each other, so we have an attraction. So these are, these are not induced forces. These are forces due to permanent aspects of the molecule. And induced forces are different because they're due to aspects of the molecule that aren't permanent, but that are brought on, they're induced. And by the way, when I talk about stronger or weaker, that's all else being equal. At the very end of this video, we'll talk about some sort of caveats to be careful about when we start ranking these forces from stronger to weaker. First, let's talk about dipole-induced dipole interaction. So if we have a molecule that's polar, and I'll switch over. Let's, stick, let's go ahead and stick with formaldehyde. So we have this molecule with a permanent dipole moment. Now imagine we have a second molecule that doesn't have a permanent dipole moment. So we could use something like uh, fluorine or chlorine or something like that. We'll just use fluorine. So we know, obviously, since the, the two atoms in the molecule are the same. This bond is not polar. There's no dipole moment here. However, we have a cloud of electrons here. And this cloud of electrons, when it's confronted with this dipole, this partially negative end here and this partially positive, the negative end's closer. So it's going to push the electrons over a bit. And so this distribution of electrons is going to shift to having a little bit more negative on that side and a little bit more positive here. So we say this is polarized. And the ability of a molecule to get polarized, or you can polarize atoms as well, is a function of its polarizability. And that is a function of how many electrons are there and how tightly they're attached to the individual atoms. Now, it turns out fluorine is not very polarizable which is uh, one of the reasons that uh, coatings with fluorocarbons are, uh, they uh, have very low surface energy and that's why they're really good for making, uh, they've been used in the past to make Teflon coatings, for instance. Um, but if, what, if, what if we were to do this with something like iodine? So iodine, we know has roughly three times, we're just looking at outer shell electrons now, but if we look at the total number of electrons, including the core electrons, for these two different um, types, these molecules made up of different atoms, there's roughly three times more electrons in um, iodine than there is in fluorine. So that means, and, and they're further, the outer shell electrons are further away from the nucleus because the, the atomic radius is bigger. That means that that electron cloud is easier to distort. And so if we were to confront that with something polar like a, like a formaldehyde molecule, we'd find that it really got polarized quite a bit more. Okay, so polarizability, the ability to form an induced dipole is something that varies. Okay, so 
we would find that the dipole-induced dipole interaction between formaldehyde and, and uh, the fluorine molecule would be weaker than the one in, in this case down here between a iodine molecule and a formaldehyde. Nevertheless, it's present in both cases. So any time, if either one or both of the molecules are polar, you always have this. So just ask yourself this question. If you're asked, do I have this force present? The question you ask is, is at least one, so it could be both. So you look at your pair of molecules and say, is at least one molecule polar? And polar means, does it, does it have a permanent dipole moment. Okay, so if the answer to that question is yes, that at least one of the molecules has a permanent dipole moment, then you will have dipole-induced dipole interaction. Okay, so that's our first example of an induced force. Let's go on to another one. London dispersion interaction. So London dispersion inter interaction is something that can take place between any two molecules. And we can start off with, um, or any two atoms really. So anytime we have any kind of matter, so let's just use a blob and this blob could be a molecule or it could be an atom. So you can imagine this being, for instance, like a krypton atom or a xenon atom. Let's just make in xenon atoms. Obviously, they're just atoms, so they're, there's, there's no dipole, it's just a sphere. But the important thing to remember here is that the electrons are in motion around the xenon, and if we were to take a snapshot of the electron density around this xenon at every, any given moment, it might not be symmetric. In other words, there might be more electron density on one side or the other. So we know if we average over time, the electron density is perfectly spherically symmetric around that around the nucleus, but it won't be at any given moment. So at any given moment, we might happen to have an excess of electrons over here, which leaves an excess of positive charge on that. In other words, a dipole. And if that happens, that's going to induce a, a parallel dipole moment in the neighboring atom or molecule. Another way of saying this is that as the electrons fluctuate around the nucleus, that fluctuation in nearby atoms tends to happen in sync. Okay, so as electrons are more on this side, these will be in more on this side, and vice versa. So they're both going to induce a temporary dipole here, will induce a dipole over here, and a temporary dipole over here, will induce one over here. So there's mutual induction between the two things. Now, when does this happen? What happens in anything with electrons? In other words, it always happens. So uh, if you're ever given a question about do we see London dispersion interaction between two, two atoms or molecules, the answer is always yes, okay? So it's always present. A common misconception the students have is that uh, there's only one or two IMFs or that there's some limit to the number of IMFs Oftentimes, an um, uh, atom or molecule will have multiple, a pair of atoms or molecules will have multiple IMFs that are pulling them towards one another. All right, so if we were to ask what IMFs are present between a pair of water molecules, we can see in this case, all the ones we've talked about are gonna be present. So we put them in terms of strong to weak. So let's just say we've got stronger, weaker down here. Start off with H bonding. We can see that we've got a hydrogen directly attached to an oxygen, and so that can be an H bond donor. We have a lone pair because that can be an H bond acceptor. And so we can see there's there's H bond donors and acceptors all over the place. So both molecules have two H bond acceptors, and uh, both molecules have two H bond donors. 
Okay, so we can have, uh, in liquid water, there's a complex network of H bonds holding the molecules together. But that's not the only IMF. We also have dipole-dipole. Right? These molecules both have a permanent dipole. And so if we draw that, we've, oops, I've reversed my arrow. Okay, so it's going to look like this, the positive ends on the left. Okay, so um, we can see we've got negative end, positive ends. They can line up in a positive and negative, pointing at each other. That's going to attract. Okay, so that's on top of H bonding. But we also have dipole and induced dipole. Just because a molecule already has a permanent dipole moment doesn't mean that you won't induce an increase in the overall dipole moment when, you, when another dipole approaches. So we're going to have dipole induced dipole. You always have that if at least one of the molecules is polar. Okay, so as this molecule approaches, not only does this have a positive end to begin with, but as this approaches, it's going to push electrons even, this negative end is going to push electrons even further to this side. So there'll be an overall increase in the dipole moment of the molecule, of this molecule, as this approaches. Now, of course, since this one is a permanent dipole, it's going to induce an increase in this one's dipole moment. So there's mutual induction in this case. So we would definitely have this one. And we always have London dispersion interaction. It's often abbreviated just LDI because that's that's always going to be there. So here we've got five or four IMFs going on at once. And even though I put this in a range from stronger to weaker, I want you to understand that that doesn't mean that this is negligible. Another example I want to give is if we look at a molecule like this, and I'll have to count how many kinks are on here because I want to have 20. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, oop, one more, 20. Okay, this is a hydrocarbon, so we know it's not going to be a polar molecule. It doesn't have a, 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 um, it doesn't have a permanent dipole moment. But if we look at two of these, so imagine that we have this plus another one just like it, okay? We know all it's got is London dispersion interaction. But it's a solid, not a liquid or a gas. Why? Well, because it's got so many atoms, and each of those atoms, of course, is going to have its, its own set of electrons. So it's a lot of electrons here. So this molecule is quite polarizable if we sum up the total polarizability of it. And so if we put one of these next to another, these are called icosanes, um, there's going to be a, a large amount of London dispersion. And so even though London dispersion is weak on an atom per atom basis, um, if we have a lot of atoms, it can be quite strong. Another example of this I'll give you is if we look at the series of chlorine versus, uh, versus bromine versus iodine. Okay, so all three of these are nonpolar molecules, but if we look at chlorine, it's a gas, bromine is a liquid, and iodine is a solid. Right? Well, all of them just have London dispersion interaction. What's the difference? The difference is that um, it's partially that we're getting to the outer electrons are further from the nucleus, and so they're more polarizable, but also there's just more electrons, right? As we go from chlorine to iodine, we've got roughly three times as many electrons. You've got this big electron cloud that's polarizable, so we can get um, a lot of induction, and so the London dispersion interaction is stronger. Okay, so even though on an atom per atom basis, this strong to weak sort of um, series holds, just make sure you're not comparing apples to oranges. Okay, so um, water has all these IMFs. It's a liquid. This has only one, and it's a weak one, and yet it's a solid. Why? Because we're adding up 20 different atoms with those weak ones, and if you add up enough, it gets strong. Okay, I don't want to belabor that point too much, and so I'm going to move on to the last thing, which is induction by ions. If we put an ion, let's take like a sodium ion, and let's put it, um, let's imagine we've got some something not polar. Okay, and I'll, it could be methane, it could be, we could liquefy krypton at really low temperatures, but just something nonpolar. Let's imagine this being like this. 
Okay, so this is something not polar. So I'll say no permanent dipole. Okay. Um, if we have this, we know what's going to happen. This electron cloud is going to be distorted by this nearby sodium atom. So we're going to draw electrons to that side of the molecule. And that's going to leave behind a deficiency of electrons on the other side. So we can, we can just do the same thing on all these. We're going to have the molecules become, become polarized in this sense. Okay, so we, we have dipoles, and they're all going to be the same way. They're all going to be orienting their negative end towards the sodium. Okay, so we don't need to have an induced, we don't need to, um, we don't need to have a permanent dipole to have this, but we can. So if I give, let me just give a different example. Let's have a sodium and let's put water molecules around it. We know in solution it's going to be the negative end of the water molecules that's going to be attracted to this sodium ion. So we could draw the water molecules like this. I'm going to save time by omitting the lone pairs. I know that you know that they're there. Okay, so I'm pointing my negative ends of the water molecules towards the sodium. Okay, so this is ion-dipole interaction. So yes, of course we have that, but also this sodium is going to push the positive, or is going to pull the negative charges in this molecule closer to it. So it's going to distort the electron cloud and, and further induce a dipole. So we have the original dipole. And we're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to make it bigger. We're going to induce it by putting it near the sodium. So we're also going to have ion-induced dipole. So we have, um, we have here, uh, we can see that sodium is going to interact with water better than something nonpolar because here we just have ion-induced dipole. Here we have ion-induced dipole and ion-dipole. And you might guess that the stronger one would be one where you're interacting with a permanent dipole plus the induced dipole rather than the one where you just have the induced dipole. Okay, so that's one of the reasons that salts are more soluble in polar solvents like water than in nonpolar solvents. Okay, so there's our example of different types of induced forces. Thank you for your time.